Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. Well, today marks a particularly special episode where we get to introduce our newest host to our show, Charlie Dixon. At Behavioral Health Today, our commitment is to present a diverse range of perspectives and voices, both from our guests and our dedicated hosts. Today, I have Charlie as my special guest, offering you, our listeners, a unique opportunity to discover more about her and a warm introduction to the newest member of our team. Charlie Dixon is a licensed social worker with extensive experience in the mental health field and currently serves as a school social worker at a North Carolina high school. Charlie received her master's of social work degree at the University of South Carolina, and her expertise has been recognized on a national level as she's been invited to present at the prestigious National School Social Work Conference on multiple occasions. She also earned a second master's degree in education with an emphasis on trauma-informed care. Charlie has worked as an adjunct professor in the education department at Benedict College and also developed social work courses and study materials for Triad as a content creator. We're so excited to have Charlie with us today to discuss the superpowers of social workers. Charlie, welcome to our show. It's so nice to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Graham, for having me on the podcast today. Well, it's really nice to have you. You know, Charlie, as we start out today, I would love our audience to learn a little bit more about you. So if you would, Start us out by telling us a bit about yourself and what life events brought you into social work. I kind of have a non-traditional route towards social work. From the time I can remember, I wanted to be a doctor, pediatrician. And so I got a bachelor's of science in chemistry um, and planned to take the, the MCAT exam. Took it as many times as I could take it at that point, it was three times. And I made the exact same score every time. At that point, I realized that maybe medicine (laughs) was not for me. And during that same time, I also was doing internships and spending a lot of times in doctor's offices and realized that I enjoyed talking with people more about their life and the things that were going on and seeing if we could figure out how to help versus just their medical issues. From there, I was really kind of thrown into social work classes. A friend of mine worked and had a graduate position for me at the University of South Carolina, and I needed to get a graduate certificate in something, and I chose the social work field. And from that very first class with uh, Dr. Nancy K. Brown at the University of South Carolina, how you doing, Dr. Brown? She really just helped me figure out that social work was where I should be. During class participation and role plays, it really felt natural to me. And while, of course, the education was important, it really just felt like that was where I should be, and social work was my calling. That's really good. You know, Charlie, I know that social workers have a unique perspective in their training in the mental health field. And I believe that those that go into social work have unique hearts, as well as a curiosity as they enter relationships. Talk with us about the ability of social workers to see the strengths of others and connect those talents in unique ways. So, Graham, I love that you say curiosity. I would call myself nosy because I really, as a social worker, I really just think we ask a lot of questions, clarifying questions, a lot of active listening, and really trying to pick apart what someone says to us, not just in their words, the things that they actually say, but also the things that aren't said. Uh, A lot of what I tell people is that I'm listening for not just your words, but what is said behind the words, your body language, your facial expressions, how you light up when I talk about certain things, or maybe how you become shy when I discuss certain things. Those are generally the the ways in to letting me know that there's something else in that topic. And along the same lines as curiosity, we really are trying to figure out people's strengths and figure out what works best for them, what they're good at, and really honing in on that and expanding those things. Everyone is good at something, and so trying to find people's strengths and what they're good at and what they feel good about generally leads you to creating great relationships with people, as well as creating a better or lifestyle or, or everything for that person that you're working with. I really like that perspective. One of the things we're talking about, too, is that you know, as a so- social worker, I-, I think you all come from a really unique perspective in the mental health field where you're not just understanding the person you know, but you're understanding and what they're dealing with in the immediate, but you take into consideration kind of a more phenomenological or contextual 
meaning for the person. You also bring in an awareness for them of how that impacts their life, their role in the family, multi-generational, maybe family systems or, you know, family genograms along the lines, communities that they're living with, even the laws that govern the things that they're living within. Talk about the incorporation of those more contextual components as you work with somebody and how you bring that to someone's awareness too. Absolutely. Um, what you're mentioning is the personal environment, classic social work skill and things that we, you know, of course, learn in school, but the practical application of that is really discussing how the world impacts the choices that you make, impacts the choices that you're able to make, the access to the environment that you live in. So in, in my specific role, I, again, work with high school students, and I've got students from every walk of life. I'm in a very interesting high school, so I've got students who are more impoverished. I have students who don't speak much English or, you know, are here from other countries. I've got students who are from wealthy families. And so there are multiple different types of conversations that I have with them. But they also always center around, this is the world that we live in. You may be affected by food instability or your family may not experience food insecurity the way that someone else does because of just the way that, you know, your family was raised or the, the access to resources that you may have, or even just the acknowledging that there is a lack, you know, in some communities that have more resource availability than others may have. Mm -hmm. I really just kind of... Uh, you know, hitting that head on, not trying to pretend that we all kind of, we live in the same world, but we don't necessarily live in the same world. We don't have the same access to the same resources. We don't live in the same environment. So even within one mile of each other, we may live a completely different life. Sometimes Absolutely. that means educating someone from a wealthier environment to what life looks like on the other sides of the world. And then yeah. giving access to those that live in more impoverished areas to what could be the possibility for their life. You don't have to stay stuck in it. Let's explore how you can get out. What else love, is there for you? I love that perspective. What could be to, like you're saying, kind of cast a vision mm -hmm. and your circumstances are one thing and those have to be appreciated. But what if we also cast a vision at the same time? Therein right. lies the hope. You know, you yep. staying, staying with the population, you know, you're talking about with the high school level, you've been in the field for a while. And you've had good exposure to even describing it right now to a great variety of people and communities. As you think of, you know, your experiences professionally, what are some of the things confronting and facing social work professionals as they address some of the various, what we might even refer to as society's grand challenges? Some of those, especially these days with inflation, the cost of everything has increased. And I think that it is becoming a much bigger problem, I think, across the board. I think when it when inflation really started to hit for us maybe a year or so ago, it was only the very, very poor um, and impoverished families or, or communities that experienced it. But I, these days, it is starting to hit all across America. It is not just one type of family that's experiencing the increases in rent or, you know, housing or gas or food, um, the yeah. access to, to not just affordable food, but healthy, affordable food. Okay. And then what that looks like to go from, I can afford everything in my life to now I cannot. And having access to resources in our communities that are able to give those resources or provide them, um, which again, the inflation creates other issues for those uh, resources because there are so many more people tapping into them then that makes it difficult for everyone to have access. But like I said, mentioned food instability, rising cost of everything with the decriminalization of certain drugs like marijuana, what the safe decarceration look like. And without a federal mandate or a federal law that makes it legal, what happens to the state law? So those types of things are, are things that I'm seeing. I actually had a student come to my school from a different state where marijuana is legal. And so he came to school, he's 18 years old, came to school and he was, like a better word, he was very high and he was just confused. And he was just like, I don't understand Ms. Dixon. I mean, I went to my last school high, yeah, my eyes are red, but I came with my book bag, I got my stuff, I'm ready for this. And so he and I had to have a real conversation about what the difference in the laws look like, what it what it feels like to live in this community with these laws, you know, the the resources that are available for him here versus where he came from. Yeah. You know, in addition to that, you're talking earlier in this part about how with 
costs going up, inflation going up, you know, laws changing, et cetera, et cetera. These things all trickle down into the family, don't they? To these, you know, young folks, whether it's, you know, family violence going up, substances being used more, you know, healthy access to good food, healthy access to good medical care. These things all trickle down and affect their lives pretty intimately, don't they? They do on a daily basis. And not just that, a lot of those things can also cause mental health issues or, or mental illnesses to be exacerbated. So it, it everything that happens in one part of, of America, especially, trickles down to all the others. As a social worker, but particularly just, you know, Miss Dixon, when they come to see you, what are they looking for from you, do you find? I find that they're looking for a smiley face. They're looking for someone to listen to them, to really hear the things that they say, to hear the things that they don't say, to acknowledge that certain conversations make them uncomfortable, to not wait to be asked, do you need resources? But instead say, you know, I noticed that your book bag had a hole in it. Would you like a new one? I have these colors available. You pick what you like. Or I noticed that you tried to get breakfast twice today. Do you need an extra snack? Do I need to send you home with something different? I noticed that you're late to school every day. Are you able to get to school? How can I help you get there? And so really, again, seeing the things that they don't have to tell me, it is sometimes difficult to say, I need help. And so I, I take my role to be helping without necessarily you having to ask me for that help. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Are you preparing for a licensure exam in psychology, social work, marriage and family therapy, counseling, or behavioral analysis? AATBS is here to help. We have been supporting behavioral mental health students to prepare for their licensure exams for more than 45 years, working with over 1 million students to succeed on test day and move on to the next step in their career. With products ranging from comprehensive courses to quiz banks and delivered live online, self-study online, and in print, AATBS has test prep solutions that meet every student's needs and learning styles. Visit us today at aatbs.com. That's aatbs.com. And use promo code BHT15 to save 15% off your next purchase. I think one of the most important core wishes and core needs that we have is to be known. And to be known, ideally, we can advocate for ourselves, but that's hard to do as a young person. And ideally, we have an adult in a position of some importance or authority who has the ability to see us yeah. and to pay attention and be curious and to make it safe enough to say, hey, I know it's that holding your backpack or the extra mail. I love that, Shillery. It's it's a that's a beautiful example of what we can bring to young people who haven't quite got the ability maybe to ask for itself or maybe there's shame around that. You know, we're talking about you working in the, I'm going to use the word kind of in the trenches, working in in the work. But I also know that as an adjunct and as a speaker at conferences, you also work kind of on at another level too. I'm curious in addition to the adjuncting, but you, I, I mentioned in the intro that you presented at the prestigious National uh, School of Social Work Conference on multiple occasions. What are some of the topics you presented on? Um, I've actually presented twice. And so the first time I presented on documentation, I was always taught in our master's uh, social work program that if it is not documented, then it did not exist. <laughs> and so one of the school districts that I worked in in South Carolina, we had a, I, I'm going to call it revolutionary documentation system that allowed us to document into a system. You could only access it on school grounds and, and school internet access, but it allowed all of the social workers in our department to see all of the information. And it worked for us because we worked in a very transient school district. So within one school year, a student may move four high schools and one school year alone. And so you were able to see, okay, yeah. so John did this at this school and it worked, maybe, maybe not. Sarah did this at this school, so maybe I won't do the same thing. Or even, and the family told this story before and it wasn't true. So I need to now ask a different set of questions to get down to what is really necessary or what they need from me. That was kind of like my first intro into public speaking. Nice. And then I also spoke about self-care. As someone who takes care of people and all of their things, 
on a daily basis, like you mentioned in the trenches, we also need to be able to tap into how do we take care of ourselves? A lot of times social workers or even any other mental health professional, we don't do that. We don't take care of ourselves. And so that particular talk was about how we take care of ourselves in a more practical way. Because a lot of self-care, they you should get a massage or you need to take a walk. But that's not necessarily always practical for every professional. Yeah, it's really good. I know that you uh, have a, a second master's and it kind of has a, a specialty, as I said in the introduction as well, around trauma-informed care. And, you know, we're willing to go into the trenches, but that requires us to hold a lot of things. And so that vicarious trauma that we can experience, that we sign up to experience and hold until someone can take back the things in, and integrate them in a non-so-traumatic way is part of the job, but it's also part of the cost. So I think that self-care is a, a really cool thing. And on, on top of that, I know you adjunct as well. What kind of class do you teach you usually when you adjunct? A little bit of everything, honestly. That's I really appreciate the opportunity at Benedict College. I'm looking for a new spot here in North Carolina, but there in Benedict, I actually taught in the education department and I taught to future educators and they were students that were wanting to be everything from elementary ed all the way up to college professors themselves. But I also taught some human services students. So they wanted to go into social work and mental health. So it's a very interesting mix of students that were kind of tailored to me, but I taught them some human behavior classes. We talked about family law and public policy and those things looked at attendance policies or attendance laws. They looked at everything from safety in school to safety all across the environment, incarceration rates, all that. It was it was a very broad course. So it really gave me an opportunity to make it my own to kind of dig into a little bit about everything that can affect a family, which really works perfectly for a social worker because that is my thing. I am person and environment and what happens in the environment and how it affects the people. Yeah, you had some fun with that course. I did. I loved it. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty nice. Very nice. Well, you know, we're kind of rounding the corner here, kind of coming home near the end of our show. I, I, if, if someone is, you know, kind of in need, let's say one of our listeners is in need, someone may be looking to address some of the mental health issues. How might a social worker be uniquely qualified to help them grow, do you think? I think that social workers are uniquely qualified, again, because they generally we are working towards creating a relationship. And being able to use that relationship to help someone find the things that they need in their lives, whether that is through active listening, asking certain questions, motivational interviewing, being able to ask you things that lead you to the solution and not necessarily just focusing on the problem. There are some social workers that are able to pre prescribe medication. That is not the route that I took um, in my educational status, but that is also an option. But really being able to provide that talk therapy and creating that relationship and connection with people, I think is something that is unique to a social worker. Yeah, really, really clearly and well said. You know, I'd love our listeners to learn more about you, Shirley, after the show and, and social work itself. How might they learn more about these? Well, I do have a LinkedIn page. It is under my name, Charlotte Dixon, L-M-S-W-M-E-D. So those are um, my licensing and my master's degrees. But then also social work is a very broad field. There are social workers in almost every, not just helping profession, but really everywhere you go, there are some social workers there. And so I just challenge listeners that are interested to Google social works, Google the social work uh, careers that are available and do some research, you know, so if, if medical social work is, is something that you're interested in, whether it's um, mental health or case management or care management, there's so many different pieces of social work. And I will put in a shameless plug for uh, the school that I have earned my master's degree, um, the University of South Carolina, Go Gamecock. There you go. <laughs> so they do have um, extensive information on their website as well about social work and the ways that social work contributes to our larger society. That's so good. Charlie, you're doing some great things. And it's been great to meet you today. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for what you're doing. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. It was nice to meet you as well. Thank you very much. You know, I also want to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining me and Charlie today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and an archive of all of our other episodes and resource materials can be found on our webpage at tryithq.com slash bht. Thanks again for being with us on the show. 
And we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.